All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So black holes sit at the intersection of several of the theory frontiers, quantum field theory, uh, quantum gravity, and quantum information. What I wanna do in this talk is to describe uh, recent progress over the last few years on uh, black hole information. Uh, this, there's been a lot of exciting progress over the last few years, uh, and it's the best kind of progress. It's the kind of progress where uh, for every question that's answered, there's there's two new ones that are that are asked. Okay, so um, I want to uh, emphasize that and point out some of the questions that have been raised by this progress, so that we can uh, lay out some puzzles and targets for the next ten years. So classical black holes, of course, are featureless objects; they're pure space-time curvature. In quantum gravity. Uh, we believe that uh, black holes have an enormous entropy given by their area over four measured in Planck units. So where is this quantum information? How is it encoded? And how does it escape when the black hole evaporates? These are all aspects of the black hole information problem, uh, but they're not just questions about black holes since black holes are pure space-time curvature. These are really questions about space-time, questions about what space-time uh, is made of at the Planck scale and how to think about it in quantum gravity. So um, in order to describe some of this recent progress, I wanna start by um, just reviewing what black hole evaporation has to do with quantum information. So when a black hole evaporates, uh, Hawking particles are, you can think of Hawking radiation as a pair production process where uh, a Hawking particle, the blue one here is escaping to infinity. That's what we usually think of as Hawking radiation, but it's created in an entangled state with a partner in the black hole interior. So these Hawking pairs are created uh, and one of them escapes and the other one stays inside. They're created in an entangled state. So um, the, the point I wanna um, emphasize is that Hawking radiation is a process of entanglement production between the black hole interior and the radiation. The paradox, Hawking's paradox, is that at the end, when the black hole is evaporated, there's nothing for the radiation to be entangled with. Uh, so the information paradox is fundamentally a problem in quantum information. It's a problem with entanglement, and it requires the uh, modern tools of quantum information science uh, to make sense of it. Now, as we heard yesterday from Xi Dong, uh, we now have a much better understanding of what's occurring uh, at the, in quantum gravity as a black hole evaporates through the discovery of the island effect. Let's look at this evaporating black hole again. Uh, the statement of the island effect is that uh, if we're interested in the quantum state of the radiation, for example, if we wanna calculate its entropy, uh, then uh, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to consider an island region inside the black hole. Uh, and that island region is gonna be chosen dynamically. It's chosen by the gravitational path integral, not by us, but we consider all possible islands corresponding to the radiation that we've collected. And uh, the way to choose the island is dictated by the entropy formula, uh, which says that we should calculate this generalized entropy, which includes a quantum field theory term and an area term, a quantum gravity term, and to extremize that entropy uh, and use that to calculate the entropy of the radiation and to determine this island in the black hole interior. Now, as we also heard from Xi, uh, this formula um, is much more than just a formula for uh, the entropy of the radiation. First of all, it's a formula for the radiation, and it gives a radiation that decreases uh, in agreement with unitarity. But it's more than that. Uh, it's also telling us uh, that when this island appears, which happens late in the evaporation process, the island region is actually encoded in the radiation. It's no longer really a piece of the black hole. It's more like a piece of the 
uh, radiation. So that proposal was made based on uh, results in ADS-CFT and holographic entanglement entropy, but uh, it doesn't require ADS-CFT. It doesn't require holography or string theory. It's a feature of the gravitational path integral. And the way to see it from the path integral, it comes from an effect called the replica wormhole, which is a gravitational instanton that can uh, appear when you have a large amount of matter entanglement. And including these gravitational instantons in the path integral reproduces this island effect. So I could explain this in terms of the entropy, but it's a little easier to, to use a different measure of entanglement called the purity. The purity uh, for a quantum state rho is uh, this trace of rho squared. So you can define this for any quantum state. And the nice thing about the purity uh, is just that if, the, if it's a pure state, then the purity is one because rho is a projector. If it's a mixed state, then the purity is strictly less than one. Let's calculate the purity of the Hawking radiation by a gravitational path integral. So we want to do a path integral that calculates the trace of rho squared. There's a procedure for translating Hilbert space expressions like this into path integrals. In this case, since there's two copies of rho, each representing a copy of the Hawking radiation, we have to have two copies of the black hole in our path integral. So one contribution to the path integral looks like this. Uh, what I'm drawing here are spatial slices of the black hole. Uh, this is the outside of the black hole and this is the inside. Um, and so in this first contribution to the path integral, this is just uh, sort of an obvious one where you have two copies of the black hole that don't uh, interact with each other. They don't do much to each other. They just exist independently. And if you just include this in your gravitational path integral, then you're going to conclude that the Hawking radiation is highly mixed, and this will lead you to a problem with unitarity. But there are other contributions to this path integral, which are connected topologies. These are the replica wormholes. Um, and when these connected topologies appear, uh, that corresponds to the appearance of the island in the black hole interior. So these are solutions of the equations of motion of Einstein gravity coupled to matter that are supported by the uh, quantum effects of the matter fields. Those quantum effects come into play and become important when the matter fields are highly entangled. So that's what I mean when I say this is an instanton that's supported uh, by entanglement. When you include these in your path integral, the Hawking radiation repurifies at late times. So there's a transition when the black hole is about half gone from this being the dominant saddle to this being the dominant saddle, uh, and you get a different value for the entropy. So what's the status now of the black hole information problem? Uh, the problem is not solved. This is a huge problem with many different uh, facets. There's uh, the page curve, which is this measure of entropy that I'm discussing. There's understanding black hole microstates. There's the infall problem. What does an observer see as they cross the horizon? There's understanding scattering and the S matrix and how black holes contribute to that. There are many others. Uh, in particular, at the center here is the singularity, which is really uh, both figuratively and literally at the center of this. Um, and hasn't really played much role in this discussion. Some corners of this problem uh, we understand much better now. Some corners have been solved, uh, but there's a lot that remains to be understood. Uh, if anything, I would say um, that this problem is even bigger than it was before. Uh, even though we've solved some corners of it and understood uh, some aspects, Lots of new questions have been raised by, uh, by the developments in quantum information over the last few years. And so I'm gonna go into some of those questions in the next few slides. A lot of this has to do with including higher topologies in the path integral and wormholes. So um, it's not just the replica wormholes, there's a whole slew of these wormholes that people have been talking about in the last few years. I want to go through uh, some of the other examples. 
There are the double black hole wormholes. So this is a, uh, this is a solution uh, or a topology where you have two black holes that are connected through the interior. From the way I've drawn it, uh, it looks a little bit like the replica wormhole, but it has different boundary conditions. So it, answer, it, it has a different interpretation. Uh, and in this case, uh, the interpretation, well, if you have a single black hole, then that is interpreted as a thermal state and it calculates for you a thermal partition function. If you have one of these double black holes, that's interpreted as a contribution uh, to what's called the spectral form factor or the product of partition functions. And this seems to give you information about the statistics of the black hole microstates. I'll come back to that in a couple slides. Another type of wormhole uh, that has been discussed are the traversable wormholes. Tra traversable wormholes can be constructed in various ways. One way is to do it in, in ADS-CFT uh, by adding double trace deformations to the theory. These double trace deformations um, dump some negative energy into the wormhole and allow you to violate uh, the assumptions of some of the no-go theorems about traversable wormholes. And these have been used to study uh, the black hole interior and uh, to study RG flows in quantum mechanics. Wormhole number three that I want to mention is the Brockett wormhole. You heard about this one yesterday. Uh, so the Brockett wormhole um, is, well, often in, in, often we think of states in quantum gravity as being prepared by path integrals. Uh, this is, for example, the hartle hawking state is prepared by doing the path integral on the hemisphere. When we calculate observables, we have to, that prepares the bra. When we calculate an observable, we sandwich that with the ket, which is the other half of the hemisphere. But what if you get a wormhole that looks like this? You know, you thought you were preparing a state by uh, doing the path integral on a hemisphere, uh, but you don't get to say these geometry, we're doing quantum gravity, you have to sum over geometries. You don't get to say what geometry or even what topology uh, you're talking about. And you should consider this one too. And that's gonna modify uh, the quantum state you thought you were preparing. So the lesson there, is that states prepared by a gravitational path integral are not always as the same. And uh, some, and I think now that this is understood better and these higher topology contributions are understood better, uh, we need to revisit some ideas in quantum cosmology and think about whether they're relevant in that context. There are more, there are lots more wormholes and higher topologies that people have been uh, talking about. Um, I won't go through all of them, to some extent, this is sort of a throwback to the 1980s uh, in a good way when people were studying the Euclidean gravitational path integral. Uh, at the time, there were a lot of interesting ideas about the effects that these, that these wormholes would have. Um, but now we're revisiting some of those ideas with the benefit of all the tools that have been developed in ADS-CFT and with the benefit of the connections to quantum information that have been developed over the last 10 years. In the last five minutes, I wanna go through three concrete questions that I think we can make significant progress on in the next 10 years. This is just a sampling. Question number one, how much does low energy gravity know about the ultraviolet? So uh, this is one of the mysterious things about quantum gravity is that the infrared knows about the UV. The, uh, the clearest example of this is the black hole entropy. That's an infrared thing that we can calculate. And it tells us about the UV density of states. Not the exact density of states, because it doesn't tell us the energy levels of the black hole. The exact density of states is a bunch of delta functions, but it tells us some microcanonical uh, density of states, which is why I put the bar. More recently, we've learned about the uh, entropy of the Hawking radiation through the island effect. So low energy gravity knows about uh, the fine-grained entropy of the Hawking radiation that allows us to calculate this page curve. These double black holes that I mentioned earlier 
uh, allow you, uh, seem to allow you to calculate statistics of black hole microstates, like the energy level spacing, statistics of the energy level spacing. I put a question mark on this one because uh, this, is, this is certainly true in two dimensions, where these have been studied in two-dimensional gravity in great detail. In higher dimensions, it's still not clear. So in higher dimensions, um, there are hints, but we don't know exactly how to interpret these. And more generally, we can ask, what else does, what else does, Einstein's, what, what else does Einstein's theory know uh, about the details of the UV theory? It's not just these one-point functions that we've been studying for so long. Uh, it's also things like this, and uh, we need to understand what else. In going, from, in going down this slide, this is sort of a story of going from simple observables, like this one-point function, uh, down to more complicated observables, from simple statistics to more complicated statistics. So uh, on the one hand, we have been learning about how to include higher topologies in the path integral. Uh, and another way of, and the outcome of this is that we're learning how to calculate statistics of uh, UV data from the infrared. Question number two, and this is related, is what is the role of averaging in uh, gravity in greater than two dimensions and in quantum field theory? So why averaging? Well, two-dimensional gravity is holographically dual to random matrix theory. This was discovered a couple years ago. And this is fundamentally different. This is a holographic duality, which is fundamentally different from our other examples, earlier examples of ADS-CFT. Because random matrix theory is not ordinary quantum mechanics. Random matrix theory has some ensemble averaging that leads to uh, contributions like these double black holes that don't factorize. So what about higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, there are many hints that averaging is present in some form and useful to us uh, as uh, in, it can be useful to us in learning about the UV theory. Um, I won't go through all the examples, but there are various examples and hints that uh, we certainly can't just ignore this idea in higher dimensions. Now, presumably UV complete theories of gravity don't involve any averaging. They should, they're, they're quantum mechanical theories. So the question is how we reconcile these two pictures. I think a tentative picture for how this might work is that in realistic theories of gravity, uh, there's an exact holographic description where you, in, you, you do the exact uh, boundary theory, say a CFT, and you compare that to the exact bulk theory, uh, say string theory, and everything's exactly equal. Uh, but that the higher topologies of the gravitational path integral uh, encode some average properties of that um, exact theory where you really include all the microscopic details. Is this picture correct? This connects to another topic, which is the conformal bootstrap. There's a small industry of matching gravity calculations to bootstrap calculations, conformal field theory, and quantum field theory calculations. Uh, most of this was developed uh, before people started thinking about wormholes, or at least before they uh, started understanding how, how to think about wormholes properly. Uh, so my question for the bootstrap is, where are the wormholes? They weren't there when uh, people were doing all these calculations, uh, but they have to make an appearance in the conformal bootstrap. Presumably, they're there in the statistics of the CFT data, but where? Question three, and this one um, I will just uh, flash up here quickly, is what is the role of quantum information and in higher topology in cosmology? Well, I'm not going to speculate on what the best approach to this problem is. This is, uh, this is presumably the hardest of the problems that I'm posing here, but also the most interesting. Uh, all I'll say is that, well, we understand quantum gravity a little bit better than we did 10 years ago, so um, can we take what we've learned and apply it to, to cosmology? Uh, so here are some white papers where you can read more, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Tom, for that uh, very clear and provocative talk. So we have plenty of time for questions. Tom was perfectly on time. So do you have any questions here in the, in the room? Uh, that picture you showed uh, with a wormhole connecting the in-state and the out-state. I mean, is there a Hamiltonian picture of quantum gravity? And what, what would that, if so, what would that uh, represent in that picture? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer. Um, I can say one thing about that, um, which is that, um, so in quantum field theory, there's an exact equivalence between the calculations you do with the path integral and the operator formalism or Hamiltonian formalism. It's just a consequence of the path integral. It's just, it's, it's built in. Uh, in quantum gravity, that's not the case. In, in, in quantum gravity, that's, we have to input that either as a postulate or uh, get that from a holographic duality. So um, that's, that kind of goes to the heart of a lot of the puzzles that I'm, that I'm describing here, that um, it, we seem to be putting in this extra postulate about the gravitational path integral, and uh, we don't have a microscopic understanding of how to connect that to the to the quantum theory. Now, in this case, um, there are some examples where these, these Brockett wormholes have been included. And they basically just tell you that if you try to prepare one state, you end up with a different one. And at the approximate semi-classical level, you can say what that state is. You can calculate its entropy. Uh, it's just different from the state you thought you were preparing. Thanks. So in, in listening to your talk, which was beautiful, I had the following question came to mind um, related to the role or not of string theory and so on that you focused on. So, or you mentioned. So there's another old example where you um, pure effective field theory, including gravity, would lead you to think there's too many states. Um, and instead, it cuts, cuts off. So this, what I have in mind is went under the name of giant graviton. So you, it appeared that uh, in the internal dimensions, you had, you know, uh, kaluza klein modes that went up um, to a level that whose count of states would disagree with the fact that the dual gauge theory has a finite number of independent um, uh, operators made from the various traces of the matrix Yang-Mills theory. So that's a case where the UV theory is the thing that made it uh, consistent, that uh, made the naive count of states um, not uh, uh, contradict what had to be true from the dual theory. Um, is there any connection between that and, and this way of making things consistent? Uh, or is this an example that addresses your point about where uh, string theory matters in these kinds of things? I don't know. That's a great question. I, I don't know the answer. As um, yeah, I don't know the answer about giant gravitons. Um, I think that there are certainly cases where string theory gives one answer that's consistent with quantum mechanics, and gravity gives a different approximate answer, which appears to be inconsistent. And then the question is like how it's not that they're really it's not that they really disagree with each other. It's that there are different ways of looking at the same problem that are that are valid in different in different regimes. And the question is how to reconcile them. I, I don't know the answer though about gra giant gravitons. Yeah, so for your question two, I, I didn't quite understand. Uh, you said there was this proposed you know, resolution or picture where the exact sum of uh, the field theory was equal to some exact sum of instantons. Wouldn't the bulk instantons include the change in topology? Maybe not. Maybe not. So uh, what happens, for example, in this work of Eberhard that I'm citing, uh, is that if you do the exact world sheet string calculation, you do that on fixed topology, uh, but that when you do the exact string theory calculation, it includes automatically the higher topologies. So the, the 
In other words, one topology is just an excitation of the of of some other topology. So it could be that um, you you sum over the instantons, and that somehow includes or encodes those topologies automatically for you. Or put it differently, maybe the topologies summarize some universal features of the instantons. We've Thanks. Are there any more questions in the room? We've got a question on Zoom, Simon, if that's all right. Uh, Azadeh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for the super exciting talk. Uh, is the possible number of quantum information and higher topology in cosmology? I wonder what would be like uh, some uh, possible examples that these two uh, topics can change cosmology because uh, yeah. I found this super exciting. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So the, the question I think is, is what does this have to do with cosmology? How could that possibly matter for cosmology? Um, let me give a, a, a one answer, which is that uh, the reason the island effect works, the reason uh, that islands appear in black hole evaporation is because uh, there's an enormous amount of entropy. There's so much, if you, if you think about the quantum part, the Hawking particles that are inside the black hole, they're violating the Bekenstein bound. The area of the black hole is going to zero, while the entropy of the particles inside are getting bigger and bigger. So the, the area is less than the entropy. And it's, when it, it's, it's that competition and the fact that the area is getting small while the entropy is getting large that allows uh, the higher topologies to contribute to the path integral and give you an important effect. And famously, uh, cosmology is another situation uh, where that occurs. So in cosmology, um, we have a lot of entropy from the matter in the universe, but it, say we're doing an FRW cosmology, if you go back to the Big Bang, areas are going to zero, entropies are constant. Uh, so again, you're in a situation where the uh, large entropy of the matter fields can potentially compete uh, with the small area term as you approach the Big Bang singularity. So um, you might be able to get contributions from island-like effects in that, in that scenario. Zoom land. No, I, I have a naive question actually, Tom. Um, at one point on your slides, you had a, you made some comment about the fact that random matrix models were holographically dual to two-dimensional gravity. Now I know the old story back in the eighties about uh, matrix models and 2D quantum gravity. Can you sort of say a few more words about the sort of holographic uh, connection that's come up recently? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a related fact. Uh, what's new about the work of, uh, about the duality of Saj Shankar and Stanford is that, uh, well, one way of saying it is that the old work has now been placed into the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence. So uh, this, is a, it's, this is a case where the random matrix is giving a theory of ADS2 gravity. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is now embedded. It's the old story, but now embedded into ADS-CFT. And so we can compare it to other examples of ADS-CFT. And the surprise is that it's, it's very different from the way we usually think of ADS-CFT working. I see. That's, that's and, and yet we can take higher dimensions and reduce them to ADS2. So these things have to be reconciled. Mm -hmm. If there are no more, oh, one more question. I don't know if there's time to double dip, I will. So, um, you, you made this comment that the conformal bootstrap should see the wormholes. And I guess it's not clear to me because you're computing something that is sensible in the dual CFT and that, and the intermediate steps don't have to agree. So if the uh, sum calculation gives a contribution from these wormholes that cancels against something else, the conformal bootstrap way of getting to the answer may may not have those same intermediate steps. Uh, am I missing something? Uh, well, I agree it might not, uh, but I think it does. And the reason is that, um, yeah, in in a in an exact theory, UV complete theory, uh, we think that a lot of these wormholes are canceled. Uh, they're because they lead to factorization problems. They have to be canceled by something. So a few years ago, you might have said, let's not even talk about these wormholes. They're going to be canceled. Why are we, why are we even thinking about them? 
Uh, but I think the, the lesson, a lot of the work in, in two dimensions and it's, it's the steps toward generalizing it in higher dimensions, the lesson is that uh, even though they're canceled, they mean something. They calculate something important. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a slightly coarse grained observable. Um, maybe it's some statistical quantity that is not one of the observables we usually talk about. But if it means something, then it has, there has to be a way to get it out of the bootstrap. So that's what I had in mind. OK, I think that's uh, the end of this talk. And so let's move on to the second speaker. Let's thank Tom once more.